Well, hello. I want to give a hearty welcome to everyone that's part of the uh, um, Booth Foundation. I wish I could be there with you in person. My name again is Dr. Stephen Smith. I'm from Faith Life, makers of Logos, and I'm very excited to share, wait for it, Logos 10. That's right. So uh, if I was there, I'd do a show of hands to see how many are uh, among us that are familiar with Logos. My expectation is that many are, but maybe some aren't. Logos is the premier Bible software on the planet. I've been around for nearly 30 years and it's gotten better and better in every iteration, beginning with, well, Logos 1. And up until recently, we had Logos 9, which was amazing. But now we're here to talk to you today about Logos 10, which is just released this month. So I'm excited to share a little bit about that with you. If you um, can actually see my screen and look at the monitors, you can actually see one of the key differences is the left hand desktop it used to be across the top and there's still an option for you to place it across the top but i think many users are going to be exciting excited about this new feature and having it on the left and sort of out of the way if you will and yet still very accessible you can also see here one of the neat features is this bible icon click on it and it immediately opens to the bible because some folks are like there's so many great things in logos i just want to read my bible to start with so um to get us going here i wanted to again formally introduce myself my name is dr stephen smith i had a chance to meet uh, reverend dr elvin sadler uh, at united seminary for a wonderful event we did on logos earlier this summer and him and i have been in touch and are excited to offer this very special pricing and discount for all of you at the booth event um, I live in Chicago and couldn't be there for the event, but really pleased. These are my two daughters. I have a PhD in New Testament. I'm a Logos user. And um, as I said, Logos 10 is here and we'll be sharing with you uh, after a short video, a little bit about how you can get a tremendous discount, 20% off on a Logos packages. That's whether you're a brand new user or if you're upgrading from a previous version. So in a moment, I'm gonna show you a little video and I invite you to stay tuned very closely to the screen what they're going to show you and i'll come on afterwards but i just want to kind of tee this up for you and show you some of the neat things that they're going to be talking about the first new feature i've already shown you and that is the left hand desktop with improved icons including the bible icon much easier to navigate secondly is something harder to show but you'll definitely feel when you upgrade to logos 10 and that is speed our program has been working vociferously for the last year or two on the speed and found all sorts of ways to tighten that up even further than it has been, which has been great on both Mac and PC. So whether you're a PC user or a Mac user, lightning speed, and also something that's not on here, a much improved mobile app as well with the uh, sermon tools and much more that are in there as well and new layouts. Print library, they're going to talk about this, but it basically gives you the opportunity to add your print books into the Logos library. So let's say there's a book by, just for example, I don't know, um, Charles Booth or RC Sproul or whomever, you go to your library and take that ISBN, click it and add it in Logos. They'll be showing you how to do this. And that way, when you're searching through all the features in Logos, your book will be included in those searches. That's an amazing new feature we're really excited about. They'll also show you easier searches conducted in Hebrew, Greek, or English. Now, you've always been able to do this in Logos, but now it's easier. You don't have to remember sort of all sorts of bracketed phrases, and they're gonna show you how to do this super easy. Church history is something uh, that has definitely been an area for an improvement in Logos, recognized over the years. And I'm very pleased to announce that Logos 10 is chock full of church history from a very advanced timeline with biblical and non-biblical events and new, new resources as well to accompany that. Translating. Um, if you're interested or need to translate your Bible or any resource in Logos into almost any modern language, you now have the ability to do, the, do so on the spot. So watch closely for that feature, whether it's Spanish, German, Italian, French, Arabic, you name it. Tagalog, it's all there and it's just one click away. Um, and so many, many more features. And so with that in mind, let's watch this short video and I'll come back on and tell you how you can save tremendously on Logos 10. Logos 10 is the newest, most powerful version of Logos Bible software. It introduces a modern, simplified design running on an upgraded underlying framework that brings significant speed improvements and a native ARM-based Mac version for all Apple Silicon chips. While focused on these user experience and speed improvements, Logos 10 is also packed with new features, letting you access your print books while searching, translate any text or resource to your preferred language, make new connections and history through the wealth of church history datasets and tools, 
and a redesigned advanced timeline tool, better manage and prepare your sermons, and much more. Logos 10 also brings massive changes to the mobile experience, especially on iPad, which now features a customizable panel design, the sermon manager, a new selection menu, draw on screen mode, the canvas and timeline tools, and much more. Let's quickly run through some of the best new features in Logos 10. First, the new modern design maximizes your vertical screen space, moving the main toolbar to the left, while also providing more context for menu options with the all-new expanded mode. Logos 10 also introduces a new simplified search syntax. It retains all the power of the existing syntax without the need for angle brackets, tildes, and curly braces. Search strings now contain simple key value pairs so that a previous search like angle bracket person god angle bracket now reads person colon god. This human readable syntax is especially obvious with more complex searches, turning this search locating all miracles connected to the Apostle Peter as either the agent, beneficiary, audience, or patient into this. We've also added three new search types. The new default All Search will return results from all your books and tools. The Book Search focuses on your library resources, and the Other Search returns entries from your personal documents, tools such as Atlas and Factbook, and more. And since Logos 10 introduces well over 42 million new Factbook tags across our library of resources, each search you run now exposes increasingly more relevant results. Third, Logos 10 connects you to your printed books with a brand new print library catalog. It's a special personalized section of your library exclusively for books you own in print, whether or not you own the Logos version. You can add a book to your print library in Logos in two ways. First, within the desktop library, click Add to Library, search for your book, and click Add to Print Library. Alternatively, you can open the ISBN scanner tool in Logos Mobile and scan any book. If Logos has the book indexed, it'll be added to your library under the Print Library filter. When searches return results from your print library, an icon indicates the result as coming from one of your print books. The entry shows a preview and a page number so you can quickly find the result in your printed resource. Next, Logos 10 introduces the ability to auto-translate the text of your resources into your preferred language. Select any word or phrase and click the Translate icon in the Selection menu to translate just that word or phrase. Or toggle on the Translation sidebar for a full translation of your text into any language you choose. With a simple translation, you can now access thousands of additional resources in your preferred language. Logos 10 also brings an entirely new set of tools to study church history, starting with the Advanced Timeline which provides hundreds of new filters, new groupings and display views, and quick access to the underlying resources behind each entry. Additionally, the Factbook now contains a vast collection of church history themes, which expose how theology developed in relationship to concurrent people, movements, and events. Finally, Logos includes the brand new Lexham Dictionary of Church History to serve as key details about locations, people, events, and more in the history of the church. Logos 10 also vastly expands preaching tools. To start with, you can quickly import any docx file into the Sermon Manager, and Logos will intelligently add your sermon, identifying metadata like passages you mentioned, your document settings, and the date. Additionally, when writing any sermon in the Sermon Builder, you can now access thousands of popular quotations from the new quotation sidebar and quickly add them to your presentation. And because Logos saves each update you make to every sermon document, you can now quickly revert your sermon to any save point from the new version history sidebar. Lastly, let me point out a few exciting improvements to Logos Mobile. To start, text-to-speech is now available on Logos Mobile for nearly any resource in your library even if you don't have an audio resource for the book, journal, or Bible. Further, all audio playback includes support for enhanced voices for a smoother listening experience. When reading any resource in Logos Mobile, a new selection menu now exposes your preferred markup options, relevant guides, tools, and resources, as well as info cards to quickly connect you to factbook entries or original language data. Logos Mobile also now supports link sets, so you can link panels to scroll together. And this includes a new follow-only option available only on mobile, 
so you can set a commentary or study Bible to follow your Bible, but not the other way around. For iPad users, we've brought over several additional advanced tools from the Logos desktop app, like the Sermon Manager, the Canvas tool, and the Advanced Timeline. You can now also enter Draw on Screen mode to mark up any view in the Logos mobile app for a more flexible study experience. Finally, iPads now offer a variety of tab layouts, which can include as many as six customizable panels for each layout tab. Across Logos Desktop, the web app at app.logos.com, and the mobile app, Logos 10 simplifies your Bible study experience by speeding up your workflow, by enhancing and surfacing your tools, and by more personally connecting you to your study, letting you translate resources into your preferred language and search your print books in real time. We can't wait to see how God uses Logos 10 to help you grow in the light of the Bible. Okay, well, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that video as I promised you, and I hope we delivered tons of new features in Logos 10. And there's so much more that we can barely scratch the surface here. But I hope you're as excited as I am about picking up a copy or upgrading your copy of Logos at the conference. And I want to share with you, all of you at the booth conference, um, how you can do that. And so what I want to ask you to do to pay attention to especially is that website that's going to be on all the slides near the bottom. And that's www.logos.com, L-O-G-O-S.com, forward slash booth 2022. Now that's the key part. You don't want to go to logos.com, that won't get you there. This is a special landing page we created just for you, just for this event. It's kind of a private deal just for all of us here in the room. So you want to go to www.logos.com forward slash B-O-O-T-H 2002. Mark that down. Take a picture of that right now. Make sure that you have that because that's where you're going to get the discounts. And I'll talk about now some of the particulars. So the Pastor Study Library, also known as the Platinum One, offers you $25,000 plus in book value. That is to say, if you were to purchase all the books, they would literally cost you about $25,000. Uh, and that is regularly priced at $21.49. Uh, but with the pricing today at the conference, the booth conference, it's just $17.19. Just $17.19. Seriously. Um, so jump into the Word with us and discover the best way for you to preach Christ crucified. There's so much here, but don't be in intimidated. Take a little bite at a time, right? They say, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And Logos is easier than eating an elephant. There's a lot here. It's a beast, someone told me recently. He said, Logos is a beast, but he meant that positively. And it is. There's so much here to really equip your ministry, your personal life, your spiritual life, your preaching, your teaching, your counseling. This is the time to do it. Don't wait. Make sure that you get it today so that you can preach Christ crucified in the way that the Lord has called you to do so. I'm going to leave you, my friends, with this quote, and I wish that um, I had an opportunity to be there with you in person. Nevertheless, uh, my name is Dr. Stephen Smith, and it's been great to be with you for uh, this time. But here's the quote from Reverend Dr. Charles Booth. One of the most exciting things about being in the favor of God is that he always blesses us with new and exciting experiences. And of course, I think Logos comes to mind, right? Is one of those new and exciting experiences that will take you deep into God's word. To finish his quote, he goes on to say, there is nothing habitual and routine about a life that is continuously being satisfied by God. So amen and amen. Uh, I want to thank again, Reverend Dr. Elvin Sadler, who's going to come back up here soon. I know he endorses Logos, thinks it's terrific. If you're a new user, just talk to someone around you that has it, and you're going to find out how amazing it is and what you've been missing out on. And if you already have it, this is the time to really up your game and take advantage of those incredible details. Again, one last time, you want to go to logos.com, say it with me, forward slash booth 2022, B-O-O-T-H 2020. I am Dr. Stephen Smith on behalf of Faith Life Makers of Logos. Enjoy Logos 10. God bless you and enjoy the rest of the conference.
everyone and welcome to our evening session uh, for the Dr. Charles Edward Booth Preaching Lecture Conference. What a delight it is this evening to introduce to you our preacher for tonight. He is a mighty prolific preacher of the Word of God and he is doing tremendous work in the kingdom as he leads the people of the St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church, Charlotte, North Carolina. You are going to be tremendously blessed as he unfolds the Word of God and brings us the Word of God. I ask that you not stand in judgment, but that you bow in your tent door, that the Spirit of God will speak through the man of God to bring us the Word of God through the person of the Reverend Dr. Robert Charles Scott, the senior pastor of St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church, Charlotte, North Carolina, and a trustee and a mentee of Dr. Charles Edward Booth. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am Reverend Dr. Robert Charles Scott, Senior Pastor of the St. Paul Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, Board Member for United Theological Seminary. And what an honor and privilege it is for me to share as far as the preaching assignment for the Charles E. Booth Lecture Series. Before I get started, I want to thank Dr. Kent Millard, uh, as well as Dr. Elvin Sattler for this wonderful opportunity to be able to share in this moment. 
I also want to acknowledge the faculty and staff, students of United Theological Seminary, as well as others that are watching this particular broadcast. Let me, before I read the text for today, just share with you all the meaning that the late Reverend Dr. Charles Edward Booth had on my life and my ministry. He was a father to me in every sense of the word except blood. His impact upon my life and my ministry cannot be estimated. Had it not been for him, I would not be where I am right now in life as well as in pastoral ministry. He came along at a very uh, important time as far as my life is concerned and steadied my rocky ship and helped me to be where I am right now. He is sorely missed. His wisdom, uh, his insight, his words of encouragement, and more importantly, his love cannot be replaced. And what a mighty oak that has fallen when we lost him a few years ago. So I stand in the tradition of his preaching prowess, uh, of social justice, prophetic witness, pastoral insight, as well as compassion and care for church community and culture. And I hope and pray that not only will I please God today, but that I will also uh, celebrate and commemorate his memory and his legacy. With that, I want to, if I could, call your attention to Paul's writings to the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 4, I want to look at verses 10 through 20, and we will seek and sense God's presence and power for this moment. I will read from the New Revised Standard Version these words. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind of you to share my distress. You Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs more than once. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that accumulates to your account. I have been paid in full and have more than enough. I am satisfied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice, uh, acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. I want to, for the time that is mine, use this as a thought. Being content in a post-pandemic world. Being content in a post-pandemic world. In our virtual digital gathering, we have some discontented people who are watching us and engaging this moment. And unfortunately, they are discontent because 
of the things that have gone wrong in their lives. If you are honest, you have to admit your sources of discontent, displeasure, and disappointment have created tension for you to the point where it seems like your life has no meaning, merit, or management because you have become stymied and stuck in mediocrity, mess, and misery. When this happens, it is because God has not claimed the place of prominence, preeminence, or priority in our lives. We claim loving God, praising God, and serving God, but many of us fall woefully short when it comes to demonstrating faith in God. This happens even with the best of us because we live in a world that has become broken, defiled, and polluted by the power of sin and haunted by the presence of the demonic. Therefore, the tendency always exists for us to find ourselves not walking by faith, but rather struggling with our sight. At the same time, we try to find some sliver of faith within the consistent contradictions of our reality. Sadly, faith fails to pop up and strengthen us when we need it most. And despair has the tendency to take over our being to the point that we put on our spiritual faces, but our psyche are carrying the heavy burden of despair. This is why some of us have issues worshiping God and praising God and serving God and obeying the Son and submitting to the Holy Spirit because we cannot function with a sense of purpose, power, and passion due to the fact that we've allowed for the craziness and chaos of the culture to make us crazy as well. Let's be honest and get real. Some had logged in at this moment using this opportunity as a moment to escape from the pressures, problems, and pains of your life. Some wanted to take this break from the troubles, trials, and tribulations of your reality. Some wanted to get away from the issues, idiosyncrasies, and yes, idiots in your space. Therefore, this gathering, this worshipful moment, is really not a time for you to focus on God, but rather to avoid and escape the trauma and drama in your life. You know your world is rather chaotic. When you get your email, read your newspaper, listen to the radio, update your Facebook status, tweet your next thought, or post your vibe on Instagram, or sneak into the dark corners of the web, you realize that we're living in a crazy and chaotic world where people have lost their mind. Think about what we're dealing with. White supremacists are now domestic terrorists. The economy is not helping the poor. Inflation is at a 40-year high. COVID is mutating at a rapid rate to the point where now we see deaths and the hospitalizations rising. Infections and death because of COVID continue to increase even with vaccinations. We see bullying through social media causing teens to commit suicide. People do not want to wear masks and even get vaccinated so that they can protect themselves and others around them. And the political discourse of this country is so uncivil until it makes one shake his or her head. However, I want to submit to you the reason why we have people who are discontent in a COVID post-pandemic world because the world has defined who we are, what we do, and where we should be rather than the God who has created and shaped us in God's image and likeness. This is why so many of us have issues carrying out the will of God and fulfilling our God-given purpose and operating in the power of God. We've allowed for society to define us. We have allowed for the culture to give shape and substance to our reality. Sin has created discontent, and we find ourselves trying to please the culture 
rather than please our Christ. Sin in our hearts has a significant impact on what motivates us. When sin serves as the motivating factor of what we do, we wind up creating idols in our space. Some people are strongly motivated by the desire to have influence and power. Others are more excited by approval and appreciation. Some of you want emotional and physical comfort more than anything else. Others want security and control of their environment. When power is your idol, you don't care if you are unpopular to gain influence. Therefore, each idol, power, authority, money, comfort, and approval creates a different set of wants and desires that do not materialize because they cannot do anything substantive in our reality. However, for a lot of us inside the church and outside the church, in Christ and in culture, the area of profound discontent is money. And money is that major idol for many of us because it feeds the more foundational impulses of our lives. For instance, some people want a lot of money as a way to control their work and life. Such people usually don't spend much money and live very modestly. They keep it all safely saved and invested so they can feel completely secure in this world. Others want money to gain access to social circles and make themselves beautiful and attractive. These people do spend their money on themselves in lavish ways. Other people want money because it gives them power over others. In every case, money functions as an idol, and it will mess us up. Therefore, when money is an idol one experiences serious moments of discontent because you have taken something that God intended to be good and put it in God's place. This is why we can't let finances drive our lives to the point that we become stingy and miss the blessings that God has for us. I want to suggest that the fourth chapter of Philippians lifts this for us. The solution to greed, stinginess, and the harmful use of money is a reorientation to the generosity of Christ in the gospel. How Christ poured out Christ's self for us. Now, you don't have to worry about money. The cross proves that God cares for you and gives you security. Now, you don't have to envy anyone else's money. Because Jesus' love and salvation confers on you a special status that money cannot give you. Money cannot save you from the tragedy or provide you with contentment in even a post-pandemic world. Only God, through Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, can do that. In the final section of Philippians, Paul thanks the church for remembering him and his needs as they had before. And if you read this passage closely, you can be enlightened about how Paul informs the Philippians about how he has remained cool, calm, and collected in a hazardous, hellish, and hideous situation. When Paul writes this letter, he is in a Roman prison awaiting his trial and pending execution, but he takes the time to express thanks to this little church in Macedonia that has been good to him. He appreciates the kindness of this small, struggling, poor church. He understands the expression of generosity because they have experienced the grace, mercy, and provision of God through Jesus Christ. Remember, the church at Macedonia in Philippi is not a mega church. This is not a 20,000 member church. This is not even a 2,000 member church. This is a small church, but this church gave aid and assistance to Paul when he needed it most. This small church felt the need to be generous and share what they had for the kingdom's sake. 
Paul takes time out to write them and tell them thank you, even though his life is hanging in the balance. He, he has something to say, and he wants to express his appreciation. But then, when you look at the writings of Paul, he says some rather stoic phrases that seems like he doesn't care what happens to him. Now, you got to understand what a stoic is. A stoic is a person who does not let his or her emotions get the best of him or her. In other words, what comes, what may. So when Paul says, for what I have learned in whatever state I am to be content, it may seem like he's rather lackadaisical or even lazy about his life. But oh, when you read the passage more closely, you have to conclude how Paul found peace that surpasseth all understanding. And this is why he starts off this section in response to the Philippian church by saying, I rejoice in the Lord greatly because you have shown great concern for me again. Isn't it remarkable to be happy because a church with small, meager resources can sow into the kingdom of God? And they did it cheerfully. I want to submit that Paul is no stoic philosopher. However, Paul kept his chin up and remained faithful and steadfast and unmovable when he could have thrown up his hands and given up. And this is the part of the puzzle that brings Paul contentment in his world that has gone crazy. How was Paul able to find contentment even though his world was being turned upside down? And how can what Paul discovered help us to function in a post-pandemic world? I want to submit several things and then I'll be done. First of all, Paul was glad, and you and I ought to be glad, that somebody else cares for the work we do for God. As Paul concludes this letter to the church at Philippi, he lets them know that he is delighted over their recent contribution because it's a sign that they care for the ministry and his work. Their sacrifice of time, talent, and treasure indicated that they clearly understand that ministry has a cost. And I want to submit to you all right now that we got to understand that ministry costs. The disciples at Philippi were led to share with Paul because Paul had been a blessing to them. He established the church in Macedonia. He was their spiritual father. They looked to him for leadership, guidance, and the teaching of apostolic doctrine. They cared for Paul's work, and they were willing to put their money where their mouth was because it was a tangible symbol that they cared. For them, it was a major sacrifice. They understood where there is no major sacrifice, there can be no space for major blessing. For Paul, there were times when he felt like preaching the gospel, teaching the gospel, engaging in the work of ministry wasn't worth it. And I can imagine there were times when Paul felt like he was all by himself. And if I could be honest, I believe that some man or woman that's watching me right now that's serving as a pastor, engaging in chaplaincy, doing the work of ministry, you feel like you're all by yourself. But I want you to know you are not alone. Some are committed to the call of Christ, the work of the church, and the purpose of ministry, who know that at times it seemed like this is a thankless job. Now, you must know that there were times when Paul felt like nobody cared. When Paul had to deal with that Corinthian church, church he has established, where his apostolic authority was under constant scrutiny, where he was always being questioned about letters he wrote, where the people were acting crazy, where he was considered a lesser figure, and where the church was in a hot mess. He, he had been shipwrecked and beaten within an inch of his life, ran out of town and put in jail on numerous occasions. At times, Paul had to deal with those original 12 apostles who had issues with him dealing with the Gentiles. It seems like a thankless job. But what this little church had done for him reminded Paul that somebody cares. 
let me remind some pastor or preacher right now that when you support the ministry, you demonstrate how much you care for the work of the kingdom. And may I suggest that even when you support United Theological Seminary through giving to the annual fund or giving as far as scholarship, you are supporting ministry. But there is something that happens when you give to the work of the kingdom. Paul lets them know that there is something in heaven that is taking place that will blow their mind because it messed me up. Paul says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit. I seek the profit that is coming to your account. In other words, Paul is concerned that they develop a grace of giving because there is spiritual interest that is accumulating to their heavenly account right now. In other words, when you give from the right place in your spirit, God is placing credit in an interest-bearing account for you that will soon provide dividends, not only in the hereafter, but in the here and now. Now, I got to share something with you because when you look at the word account in the Greek, it is translated logos, L-O-G-O-S. Logos is what we see as a description of Jesus going back to John chapter 1. When John said in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word was made flesh and tabernacle among us in the tenement of clay. In other words, uh, when you look at the word logos, logos is where we get the modern word logic. Logic is how you and I engage in reasoning and rationalizing our particular reality from a cognitive perspective. So watch this. If Jesus is the word of God or if Jesus is the logos of God, then Jesus is the fleshly articulation of the mind of God. And if Jesus is the fleshly articulation of the mind of God and the word account here is logos, then that means that if you got Jesus, Jesus is going to guarantee that your account will get what it needs when you do what you're supposed to do. Oh, I feel like preaching. Could it be? Watch this. That since our finances, since our money, uh, or an extension of us, that when we give to the local church, when we give to a seminary, when we give to ministries of compassion, care, and concern, that we get a better view of who Jesus is because it's real hard for you to be an authentic disciple, a legitimate follower of Jesus Christ, and still be stingy. So, when you give tithes and offerings, when you give to United Theological Seminary, when you give to other ministry, there is interest accumulating to your spiritual account. When you give to places that are serving the poor and the oppressed, there is interest accumulating to your spiritual account. God has a way of compounding your interest to the point where you can sing that song of the African-American church experience. You can't beat God's giving no matter how hard you try. And just as sure as you are living and the Lord is in heaven on high, the more you give, the more he gives to you. But keep on giving because it's really true. You can't beat God's giving uh, no matter how hard you try. But then Paul wants us to understand that he found contentment because Paul knew where his strength came from. And you and I ought to find contentment when we know where our strength comes from. To appreciate this comment, you got to really understand the whole letter that, y'all, that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. In one part of this letter, Paul has delineated his professional resume, his curriculum vitae, his public pedigree, his Hebrew heritage. He talks about how he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, circumcised on the eighth day, came from the tribe of Benjamin, how he was a student of the famous teacher Gamaliel. He had it going on. 
but he realized that his strength did not come from his education and his strength did not come from his pedigree because those things did not sustain him when he was in a Philippian jail with his boy Silas, shipwrecked on the Aegean Sea, ran out of town, or even whipped with 39 lashes. Paul wanted them to know that the joy he has in receiving their gift was not because they met his need. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, earlier, he sounded rather stoic. It seemed like he was a self-sufficient, self-made man. But with that statement, he transformed the same stoic-sounding sentences that came before to a sufficiency that was beyond him. He says that it is through Christ, or in some translations, in Christ. Paul turns self-sufficiency into contentment because of Christ's sufficiency. In other words, when you know that your strength comes from God through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, it gives you the ability to do what seems to be impossible. Now, what gets me in the, the Greek word strength is in dynamu, which is where we get the word dynamic and also the word dynamite. When you know Jesus Christ strengthens you by the power of the Holy Spirit, there is an unleashing of power that can liberate the oppressed, move mountains, conquer the demonic, overcome obstacles, transform secular spaces into sacred places, heal the sick, and even raise the dead. This is why Paul was able to do what he did because he knew where his power came from. When you know, beloved, where your power comes from, you can do what seems to be impossible and even unimaginable because it's not you doing it. You are doing it through Christ. There's a story about during the time of the depressions when atheist Clarence Darrow was addressing a group of people on the south side of Chicago, most of them were black. The economic conditions, you know, at that time were rather horrible. Money and jobs were scarce. Darrow uses that fact to point out the blight and plight of black people in Chicago in these here United States of America. And he sums up their woes, concluding, and I quote, and you sing. No one can sing like you do. And what do you people sing about? And quick as a flash, a lady in the congregation jumped up and hollered, we got Jesus to sing about. That messed Darrow up because he had no comeback for that. The reason that my ancestors, my forebearers in Chicago were able to sing through their tears and their fears is that they walk with the one who strengthened them to do all things. Get your education through Christ. Get out of debt through Christ. Survive your disease through Christ. Overcome cancer through Christ. Deal with a bad relationship through Christ. Forgive your enemies through Christ. Change your community through Christ. Deal with politics through Christ. Smile when you feel like crying through Christ. Shout when you feel like sighing through Christ. Live when you feel like dying through Christ. And keep on going when you feel like giving up through Christ. Love when you want to hate through Christ. And worship and give God praise through Christ. Ha! Ah. Finally, Paul recognized who is able to supply not his needs, <laughs> but their needs. Uh, Paul, Paul knew he could not repay them and they weren't looking for payback. But Paul informs those disciples at Philippi, that because they had given to his ministry, that God would take care of their needs. God would take care of their need 
because they had given to the work of ministry. And as they supplied Paul's needs, Paul now speak to their need. Some see these words as a prayer and a wish. However, this is more than a prayer. <laughs> uh, I want you to know this is a promise. Some prayers are answered with a note. Some prayers are answered, let me be slow. But this is more than a prayer. I want to contend this is a promise. This is in reference not only to their spiritual needs, but their physical needs material needs as well. Paul reminds his benefactors that God will do what he is in no position to do. That God will reimburse Paul's benefactors. The assurance of the divine supply of the Philippian needs implies that they have given so liberally that they left themselves with some real needs physically, financially, and materially. Yet, it is true that those who share generously with others, especially advancing the work of Jesus Christ, are promised a divine supply of anything they might lack because of their generosity. I am a black Baptist preacher, I realize that I am in an academic moment. I understand that uh, this particular uh, ethos calls for a certain kind of decorum when it comes to homiletical expression. But 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 I, I, I feel I feel I feel something. Yeah, uh, uh, pushing me uh, because. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel something pushing me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I feel something pushing me. Because when you break down this 19th verse, this is what you find. And I have to admit that Dr. Melvin Wade helps me with this. Says, my God tells us who God is shall supply, tells us what God will do. According to his riches and glory, tells us of God's resources. By Christ Jesus, tells us how we're going to get it. My God deals with the language of faith. Shall supply, deals with the outlook of faith. All your need, deals with the testimony of faith. According to his riches and glory, deals with the promise of faith. By Christ Jesus, deals with the hope of faith. My God, is the source of the supply. Shall is the certainty of the supply. Supply is the extent of the supply. All your need is the fullness of the supply. According to his riches is the measure of the supply. In glory is the storehouse of the supply. By Christ Jesus is the person of the supply. And since the God we serve is outside of humanity and beyond humanity and yet with humanity by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, God is ready with limitless provision and is more than able to supply your need. Whatever you need, if you ask in faith, God will provide your need. God will give you an extension of life like God did for Hezekiah. God will forgive, confess sins like God did for David. God will give you wisdom like God did for Solomon. God will come to your aid like God did for Daniel. God will come in a fiery furnace like God did for the Hebrew boys. God will grant you mercy like God did for Habakkuk. God will give you favor like God did for Mary. God will send you rain like God did for Elijah. God will stop the sun like God did for Joshua. God will open the Red Sea like God did for Israel. God will save you like God did for Paul and Silas. God will hear your prayer like God does for all of us. And before whatever you need, you ask of God. Before you start out with our Father, God knows you need bombs for your bruises, cure for your calamities, deliverance from distress, eraser for your errors, 
fixing for your faults, grace for your gloom, healing for your hurts, joy for your journey, mercy for your misery, hope in your hell. And before you say amen, God knows your need, provisions in poverty, strength in weakness, forgiveness for your sin, peace in confusion, sight for blindness, light for darkness, love for hatred, grace for your shame, hope in despair, life where there's death, pardon in your troubles, victory in defeat, salvation for your sins. And when you know all that God can do, you have no problem telling the Lord, thank you, even in a post-pandemic, post-COVID world, knowing had it not been for the Lord on our side, we would not be here right now. Good evening, and we are absolutely positive that you have thoroughly enjoyed today. And what a blessing it has been to have you here with us all day Tuesday, Tuesday evening. And we believe that you are going to be able to help your church, to help your family, to help your community in many different ways. One of the ways that we are absolutely positive that you can help us also is to give to the Charles E. Booth Scholarship Fund here at United Theological Seminary. There's a couple of three different ways that you may be able to give. Number one, you can give online at give dot united dot edu and to include Charles Booth scholarship on the memo line. The second way that you can give is you can send a check to United Theological Seminary. The address and all the information is online there and on your check again make sure that you just include the Charles E. Booth content. And then the third way you can give is to look at the addresses on the screen and we are positive out of one of those three places that you will be able to give an offering. Let me share a couple of things with you. Charles Booth ordained me a couple days ago. The other thing is Charles Booth was my pastor for about four years before God called him home to heaven. And Charles Booth is worthy and he deserves to be remembered. And you giving to this scholarship fund to help other people who are coming after you is going to be extremely beneficial. So I really plead with you to open up your billfold, open your checkbook, and write a monstrous offering to the Charles E. Booth Scholarship. I know I can count on you because I've counted on many of you for the last 18 years. So God bless you and may heaven continue to smile upon you and thank you.